I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and the other creative arts. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join for just $1 or $5 per month, or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist, $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode beginned. I have just a few Carl King the Human updates this week. First, I released a new Patreon-only song. It's a re-recording of my 1997 Sir Millard Mulch song, The Boy with the Perfectly Square Butthole. And I will play a 30-second clip now. I must be missing something. What makes me so damn odd? So damn odd. So damn odd. So damn odd. One day he got an idea, he cleansed himself of fear. He went into the bathroom and grabbed a hand of beer. He dropped his pants and undies and stood up on a chair. And much to his amazement, his butthole was perfectly square. His butthole was perfectly square. His butthole was perfectly square. And you can hear the entire song, as well as an alternate mix, only on Patreon. Second, I just finished and posted the full-length, rough, text animatic of my new animated pilot, Dragon Tooth Inn. It's got all the voice acting, the rough musical score, and the shot timing. And you can also watch and hear that entire thing inside my Patreon. Third, Nils Freikdahl of Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum and Free Salamander Exhibit has taken us all by surprise because he just started his own Patreon project called The Nothing Show. It's a sort of podcast in which he narrates and discusses eccentric works of literature. The Nothing Show is fantastic and 100% necessary, and I will put a link in the show notes. And now, let's officially get beginned with this week's analytical musical analysis of the week. This week's analytical musical analysis of the week is Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum's 1997 Tonight We're Gonna Party Like It's from their album the grand opening and closing. And hey, I was just talking about them. What a coincidence. I'm going to mainly focus on that instrumental breakdown or bridge. You know the one where the guitar, bass, and violin are playing a dissonant ascending chromatic line, accenting a tricky syncopated rhythm with the drums. And some might be tempted to call this metric modulation but since there's a steady pulse, and most of this is in 4-4, I would personally not call it that. Also be aware that through most of this instrumental section, the hi-hat, or whatever symbol that is, I'll refer to it as the hi-hat part, and the snare are playing a consistent 4-4 pattern. The hi-hat is playing quarter notes, and the snare is on 2 and 4. It is only the kick drum pattern that changes, for the first several segments anyway. Disclaimer, there are other ways of counting some of these rhythms with other more nuanced time signatures, but I am choosing to relate everything here to 4-4 four, four 
because that's what the main groove of the song is, and it all fits into a quarter note pulse. I've broken this whole instrumental section into seven separate segments with their own distinct syncopations. And I think that as we go through this, you will realize that individually, most of these segments are quite simple and straightforward drum beats, but they sound tricky when strung together. And the length of each segment is another element that throws off our ears. And I'd like to thank Linus Abrahamson for his notation assistance because he definitely cleaned up my mess. And with that and this, here we go. Segment number one, we are in 4-4 with a swung triplet groove. And this could have been written in 6-8, but instead we have a measure of 4-4 four, four, followed by a measure of 5-4. And it sounds like this. And with counting, it would sound like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. That's the hi-hat playing quarter notes, snare on two and four, and the kick playing on swung eighths. And that's all it is. If the whole song were this rhythm, there would be nothing surprising. But this groove only continues for nine beats. And don't get tricked by those kick drum 16th notes at the very end of beat five, which is actually an anticipated syncopation that belongs to segment two. In segment two, we are back to 4-4, and we are now moving from swung to a straight 16th subdivision. The kick pattern changes to syncopated straight 16ths playing on the E and uh of each beat. And you might know that sixteenths are counted as one e and a two e and a. And this continues for two measures and sounds and looks like this. And if you were to count it, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. In the next segment, segment three, we are back to the swung eighths again, or that triplet groove. And in contrast to the previous groove, it throws us off. But by itself, it's nothing unusual. It sounds like this. And if you were to count it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. For segment four, we are back to straight sixteenths on the kick, but it's playing on the downbeat, and then from then on, every third sixteenth note. And in notation, we end up with dotted eighth notes and sixteenths. This time, we have a bar of 4-4, four, four, and then a bar of 5-4. And it sounds like this. And here it is with counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. So notice that the second bar is extended out to five, four to allow for that triplet kick drum groove to land on beat one in the following segment. And they seem to be doing this each time they introduce an odd pattern. So we have a total of nine beats here. For segment five, this gets a little more tricky. We are back into swung eights again, or a triplet groove, but that kick drum is now playing a pattern of three swung eights followed by an eighth rest, which is conceptually a unit of four. And that goes for three measures of four four and sounds like this. And here it is with the counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
Now, in segment six, this is where the beat gets downright difficult because these subdivisions are not a normal relationship between the feet and hands outside of prog rock. As bizarre as this part sounds, that hi-hat is still on quarter notes. But the kick and snare are playing a pattern in 516. So it's little groupings of five notes in which the kick plays two 16th notes, the snare plays a 16th note, and then there is a two 16th note or eighth note rest. And then the pattern repeats underneath that same 4-4 hi-hat pattern. And this can be very confusing to work out if you're not used to it. The whole segment is three measures of 4-4 and one measure of 3-4, which adds up to a total of 15 beats, allowing the pattern to come back around on the downbeat of the next segment. And it sounds like this. And here it is with the counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Now for our final segment, segment seven, the drum shift into a solid pattern of five sixteenth notes, bringing in the toms and some sort of china symbol, repeated for two measures of four four. And then it extends another two beats, and we have a two beat rest before the chorus comes back in. So segment seven is three total measures of 4-4. Four, four. And you could also measure this pattern out in a time signature like 5-16. But as I said, I prefer to keep everything in 4-4 four, four when possible. And it sounds like this. And with the counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. Now let's play the whole thing with counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Now, as extra credit. I wanted to throw in a short explanation of that confusing, chugging, rhythmic dun 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 interlude that happens as a turnaround before the verses. And here's how I think that works. According to my dark mathematics, it is eight notes spaced out across three beats. So in this case, they would be dotted sixteenths. And that is followed by two quarter notes played staccato. And I have notated that in 5-4 because that would contain the entire phrase. Now, I actually sent all this stuff off over to David Shamrock, the original drummer on this track, and he had a different recollection of how that hook was constructed. He had this to say, quote, rather than eight beats over three, it's actually two sets of triplets plus two thirds of a triplet. The last third of the final triplet is omitted. That gives you the eight notes that you were hearing. And if you tap your foot to the rhythm, it should sound like triplets, but with the last third of the final triplet cut off. I don't believe there is a conventional way of notating that, but it is something that Nils and I have always been fond of doing on occasion. However, the plot thickens because I lined the original recording up to clicks in Cubase all three of those dun 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 riffs, and they are not quite triplets. Now, David did say that there maybe have been some pushing and pulling of the tempo, and that their intent was triplets. 
but eight notes across three beats does actually match the recording. Either way, thank you to David Shamrock for giving me insight into the original compositional intent. And I'd also like to thank Dale Turner for his late night assistance in solving that rhythmic mystery or not. And remember, I interviewed Free Salamander Exhibit, including Nils Freikdahl and David Shamrock, in episode 12 of this very podcast. So go give that a listening, because I will put a link in the show notes. I always learn a thing or two by analyzing and transcribing a piece of music, even if it's a piece of music that I think I know very well. So if you have not done this before, I recommend you try it. And now let's move on to this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is Summer School from 1987, directed by Carl Reiner and screenwrited by Jeff Franklin. I happened to meet one of the stars of this movie last weekend at Pasadena Comic Con, and that star was none other than Dean Cameron, Cameron, who plays the character Chainsaw. I got his autograph and watched him speak on a panel along with several of his co-stars. And it brought back memories of how much I loved this movie when it came out. Now let's talk about the musical score. I had forgotten that this was scored by Danny Elfman. The movie starts with an intro montage of The Last Day of School over a song by Mr. Elfman called Happy. But wait a minute, this is not his only song called Happy. He released another one in 2020, which was 33 years later, with a much darker sound. And that makes me wonder, does he have more songs called Happy? We don't know yet. Would have been funny if every song he'd ever written had that title. I bet he would have had a much bigger career. Now, about the actual scoring, I had never noticed it before, but the Danny Elfman moments are obvious now, like that Thurman in the horror scene. But back to that opening musical montage. Since it's the last day of school, one of the students returns their textbook, and it is totally destroyed. The binding is gone, the pages are all falling out. Folks, folks... That's how bad my school books were, and my mom had to pay for them every year. I never did my homework, but I'd still keep them all with me everywhere and only use them to do destructive things. Like I would skimboard on them across the concrete sidewalks, and I would erase random words from the pages and smash greasy chocolate chip cookies into them. I always thought going to a locker is a huge waste of time, so I carried them all in a large, thin duffel bag, and I would swing that duffel bag over my head and repeatedly slam it onto the ground, and it would eventually tear open, books and leftover food and trash going everywhere. It was a fun mess. And of course, being such a good student, I went to summer school every year. So that is to say, I identified very much with these characters who did not take high school seriously. So let's talk about those characters. There are somewhere between 8 and 11 students in the summer school class, and some of them have non-speaking roles, and some of them come and go randomly. Now, because this movie is largely character-driven, we get to know their personalities very well. Every scene allows the characters to express their individuality, whether they're at a petting zoo, in the library, or at the beach. These are all chances to reveal character, not for the purpose of plot or action, but to make them feel real to us. 
So this movie is a dang good writing exercise. You take a dozen characters, place them in random environments, and ask yourself how each of them would behave. Now let's talk about some of those notable characters. There's Francis Gremp, who likes to be called Chainsaw, and I'm assuming that's because he's embarrassed of his real name. But was that detail necessary to the plot? I don't think so, but it did add depth. But here's a more important question. Is Chainsaw the original inspiration for Kevin Smith's trench coat and backwards baseball hat look? It's possible, but we don't know yet. Anyway, the character is a high-energy, rebellious class clown. He pranks the teacher, he breaks laws, he says clever things, all while he is wearing an Iron Maiden shirt. The character Dave is his best friend, played by Gary Riley. But here's an important writing and budgetary question. With so many characters already, did the story really need two of that character type? Like, did it need both a Bill and a Ted? And this movie was two years before Bill and Ted, by the way. Hmm. But yes, having the duo definitely worked. We ended up with superb comedic acting by both of them, and it was a good representation of high school friendship as we follow two smart misfits who are obsessed with horror films. And not to belittle the other roles, but we also get every 80s high school stereotype. A nerd who's allergic to everything, a jock who carries a football with him everywhere, a pregnant girl, a dyslexic girl, a dude who moonlights as a male stripper, a foreign exchange student, and a surfer girl who is intent on moving in with her teacher. That is a heck of a lot of characters, yet the movie wove their lives together perfectly. And that's only the students. There are three other main characters, their teacher, Mr. Shoop, played by Mark Harmon, there's the vice principal who hates him, and Kirstie Alley as his love interest. Now that's somewhere around 15 main characters we get to know. And that's not counting Mr. Shoop's dog named Wonder Mutt, who has a character and story arc, and the dog's toy has a name and story arc. So there is a lot going on. Now let's talk about the editing. There are few, if any, establishing shots or indications of passing time between scenes. And this can create confusion if you're paying attention. For instance, there was a hard jump in time from when Mr. Shoup finds out he's teaching summer school, which was the last day of school, and day one of summer school. Those two scenes are butted right up against each other in the same location at the same time of day. But during that time, several days or a week or more should have passed. And I had to rewind it and check. Is he actually wearing the same clothes from one scene to the next? Was this meant to be the same day? No, it's clearly a different day. In that day one of summer school scene, Mr. Shoup talks to his teacher crush next door, Robin, played by Kirstie Alley. But when he walks back into his classroom, because the scenes are glued together, we get another time jump, and his classroom is now full of students. But these are not logic or continuity errors. I would just call it dangerous editing. Let's talk about the acting and directing. There are many non-essential physical character moments that are so organic they feel like improv. When they're in the library and Chainsaw says, the human brain needs rest, he knocks on Dave's head three times. And in perfect sync, Dave knocks on the wooden table they're sitting at, making it sound like his head is wooden. Now, was that in the script? Because it reveals that those two guys have coordinated jokes. Another of my favorite moments is when Mr. Shoop 
is getting fired by the vice principal. And in the middle of a conversation, at the very end of another unrelated line, he says, watch this. And he throws his hat around a coffee mug on the desk as if playing horseshoes. And it has nothing to do with the conversation or scene, but it brings it to life. Now, this list could go on forever. In another scene, Chainsaw is at his desk with his hat off, and he's scratching his hair furiously with both hands during roll call. Now, why was he doing that? It was a non sequitur. And there's another when the principal opens his office door, and for just a split second, Chainsaw is standing there smelling his own armpit. And Dave has moments like this as well, like when he's teasing the nerd character in the background throughout one of the scenes. He's leaning way over across the aisle and just touching him constantly, making him uncomfortable. And these are small and powerful ways of inhabiting the characters. Now let's talk about the plot briefly. As I said, this movie is character-driven, but it also has clear stakes. The students all need to pass summer school to save Mr. Shoup's job, which isn't an overbearing plot and only comes in towards the end of the movie. And there's only one implausibility that I noticed. On the first day of summer school, Chainsaw and Dave already know Mr. Shoup. They call him by name, and they're excited that he's the teacher. But Mr. Shoup doesn't know them at all when he calls roll, and that's for the sake of the movie introducing the characters to us. To wrap it up, this movie has a positive meaning and message, and that is, through all of his faults, instead of teaching them remedial English, Mr. Shoup actually helps each of the kids in the ways that they need it. And because of this, in the end, he succeeds. I gave this film five out of five stars on Letterboxd and a little heart because of all that physical character acting detail. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thank you to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, a war puts a man through many, many changes. <laughs>